Just don't tell anyone, all right? Got it. Won't tell a soul. Cheers. Ben, you will never guess what I just... Starting off the news this week, NASA has sent an instrument that will track carbon dioxide levels on Earth to the International Space Station. The OCO3 observer was launched from a SpaceX Falcon 9 on Saturday and is made from spare parts from the OCO2. The readings for OCO3, coupled with the readings from OCO2, should give scientists a better view on how CO2 moves around the atmosphere. By pulling together the data of both these observers, who will have covered different areas of the globe, scientists could compile future reports on how we can more effectively reduce our damaging CO2 emissions. This week, there's been some very troubling news as a report published by the United Nations-backed Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services has found that the natural world, and therefore the future of our own species, is at great risk. 145 experts from across the world have reviewed about 15,000 scientific and government sources to produce the first major examination of the health of the world's biodiversity since 2005, and the findings are not good. Also using knowledge from indigenous and local people, in addition to scientific publications, the analysis has concluded that due to human impacts, one million species could be made extinct within the next few years. There is overwhelming evidence that humans are to blame for this increased rate of extinction, with the main issue being land conversion for agricultural purposes, followed by overfishing, bushmeat hunting and poaching, climate change, pollution and invasive species. As the IPBES chair Robert Watson says, we are eroding the very foundations of our economies, livelihoods, food security, health and quality of life worldwide. The report assures that we can still reverse some of the effects of this biodiversity crisis, but we will need more sustainable food production and other resources, more of an effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and proactive environmental policies. The summary of this report was released on the 6th of May, and the full analysis will be published later this year. Some less depressing news next, as a study has reconstructed the evolutionary history of angiosperms, or flowering plants, using the genes from a wide range of living species. The study then dates the origin of the angiosperm crown group to the Upper Triassic, which is much older than the earliest known fossils of these organisms, and so the researchers have named the difference the Jurassic Angiosperm Gap. Thanks again to Nestleg20 on Discord for this one. Also this week, paleontologists have investigated a possible way that dinosaurs began flapping their wings, eventually leading to flight in birds. Looking at Chordopteryx, the most basal of all non-flying dinosaurs that still had proto-wings, they applied a mathematical approach to determine that when the animal ran at a certain speed, the vibrations from this would have forced the arms to flap. They tested this with a life-size robot of the dinosaur, as well as putting fake wings on an ostrich, and it's possible that in this way dinosaurs were trained in wing flapping. Also in paleontology news this week, a study has looked at the evolution of hadrosaurs, a highly successful group of herbivorous dinosaurs. The researchers basically found that the unique feeding apparatus of these animals, with their complex dental batteries and specialised jaws, evolved quickly in a single burst, and they remained relatively unchanged in later species, whereas the strangely shaped display crests on the heads continued to diversify in several radiations. And finally, some very good news to end this week's episode, as we welcome yet another new Tyrannosaur to science. Named Suscitoranus hazeli, this was a small, about three foot tall species of Tyrannosauroid from the mid Cretaceous of New Mexico that has been placed as intermediate between the older, small bodied Tyrannosauroids and the later giants. First discovered in 1997, more remains were found in 1998 by the lead author of the paper when he was 16, and the fossil preserves evidence of key Tyrannosaur anatomies, such as adaptations in the feet for running, adding further to the idea that the first tyrant lizards were fast, small, much more gracile creatures compared to the bone-crushing forms that evolved towards the end of the Cretaceous. The name Suscitoranus comes from the Zuni Native American tribe word for a coyote, Susky, so the name means coyote tyrant. The species name Hazeli is named after Hazel Wolf, who supported many of the successful expeditions to the locality where this animal was found. 
Thank you again to Nestlig20 for making us aware of this one, and thank you also to the Dinosaur Guy and Glavanikus for sending us the other news stories. Sorry we couldn't include all of them since there's been so much stuff this week, but keep them coming on the Discord, it's been very useful for us. Thank you very much for watching this week's 7 Days of Science, and a very special happy birthday to David Attenborough, an inspiration to all. Do feel free to subscribe if you haven't already, and if you want to learn more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life around you. And if you have, we'll see you on Sunday.